There we go, look at how bright I am and how nice I sound. And a nice looking background. Wow, could this be it? Could this be the first video where I'm 100% happy with how I sound and look for the entire video? I hope so. Greetings Realm Lords, Core Bricks here, and welcome to another video. Now in my last video, we looked at the basics of combat in my sprawling Lego board game that has taken over half of my basement. In that video, we saw the rebels get into a fight against the kingdom forces over the Oracle, and our rebels ended up slaughtering those kingdom forces and taking the Oracle for themselves. It was a great mock battle to show you guys how combat looks in the Circle of Realms. And that video really focused on the basics, but I do need to make one follow-up video, which is this that explores some of the more advanced aspects of combat. And then I can close the book on combat, probably close the book on the rules, and I'll switch back over to looking at some units and doing a deeper dive into my factions. Now, even though the Rebels won when we left off last time, there was somebody on the way to take the Oracle back, and that was Prince Jalen de Leon. So Prince Jalen de Leon's running at the Oracle. He is ready to take on these Rebels and to avenge his fallen Hawk Knight and Kingdom Arbalists. And as he does so, we will get to see how height advantages work in the Circle of Realms, in addition to attacks of opportunity, fortifying, and dismemberment. So let's head over to Surla, let's look at that oracle, and see what's going to happen there to see these different maneuvers used in actual combat. Now, to make things a little bit more interesting, I'm going to retcon our last video just a little bit. You see, it's occurred to me that Prince Jalen is loaded with piercing armor, and so the woodsman wouldn't be able to hurt him at all. And I'd like to talk about a few things with ranged attacks. So let's give one of these woodsmen a better weapon that can actually cut through Jalen's armor. Let's give him a blunderbuss. A blunderbuss is one of the weapons you can find in the Circle of Realms. It has an attack of only four, but its attack type is universal. So we're basically substituting his crossbow ranged attack for a blunderbuss ranged attack. It's got the same range, it's just gonna be able to cut through Jalen's armor and hit him a little bit harder. I don't wanna make this too easy for the prince. Now, as our rebel player starts his day turn, it might not really look like he can do a whole lot in this position. His militiaman is a melee unit. He can't go and engage Prince Jalen, at least not while he's trying to hold the line and protect that ladder leading up to the woodsman. And our woodsmen, despite being ranged units, only have a range of five. Even our friend over here with the blunderbuss can't shoot more than five spaces normally. But there's one aspect of elevation that we did not talk about in our last video, and that is height advantages. So we saw how melee units get bonuses or penalties depending on whether they moved up or down before they're attacking their targets. Well, range units get something similar if they're standing above or below enemy figures. And there's actually two ways that height advantages benefit range units in the Circle of Realms. For starters, it can improve a unit's range. If a unit is shooting down at another unit, then for every full height that that unit is standing above the enemy unit, then we're gonna add one to its range. For the vast majority of units, this means for every five pegs you are above another unit, then you're gonna add one to your range, up to a maximum of plus three. And if we look here and measure out our height here, of our woodsman, he is standing at least 15 pegs above where Prince J1 is standing, since Prince J1 is just standing on the base here. So that means our woodsman now has an attack range of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. He is perfectly in range of Prince Jalen. The second benefit of a height advantage is damage. Just like a momentum bonus can result in a minus one modifier to defense roll or a plus one modifier to defense roll, if your unit is standing above the top of an enemy unit when you attack them, then that defender is gonna have a minus one modifier to their defense roll. Likewise, if the defender is standing up above your ranged unit, then the defender is gonna get plus one to their defense roll. But of course, in this situation, Jalen is definitely below our woodsman, so Jalen's defense is going down. And not just by one, but actually by two, thanks to the wood Woodsman's tactical positioning ability. This gives them a plus one bonus at anyone they're attacking as long as they're standing above them in any way, shape, or form, and it does stack with the normal height advantage. So let's see what our Woodsman can cook up in this attack. Now our Woodsman has a base attack of five plus that four universal from this blunderbuss, so let's see what that ends up coming out to. And he rolls an attack of six. This is quite a bit of pain coming into the Prince because six is a multiple of the precision rating of three, meaning we've got a critical hit on him. We have six damage coming in, and Jalen's defense isn't going to be eight against this. It's going to be only four. Thankfully, the Prince rolled a four, but that's going to go down one from the height advantage and one from tactical positioning, so the defense roll is only two now, meaning Prince Jalen is going to take four damage from this attack. Now, Jalen's got more health than a non-hero, but he still only has 25 hit points in total, so... 
So four damage is almost a fifth of his health gone. Now a rebel player could attack with his other woodsman if he wanted to. He does get the range bonus from that height advantage. But the most damage this woodsman can deal with his crossbow is seven piercing damage. And Prince Jalen's got a breastplate that will block nine of that. And so we'll go to our kingdom player's turn. He's just gonna move Prince Jalen forward four spaces. One, two, three, four. Getting him closer to those rebels but still unfortunately keeping him right in the line of sight of that woodsman with the blunderbuss. And so when our knight turn rolls around, despite the penalty of knight, our bravo player thinks it's still a good idea to attack with the blunderbuss against Prince Jalen. So let's see how he does. Now keep in mind, because it is knight, we're gonna subtract our precision rating from our attack here. So our woodsman's base attack of five becomes only two, plus our universal four damage from the blunderbuss. So let's see what happens here. And our Woodsman rolls a six, another critical hit on Prince Jalen. Oh boy, the Prince has got to be getting agitated now. So let's see what he rolls for his defense. And he rolls a one. Now we're gonna subtract two from that, which would make it negative one, but we can't turn a defense negative like that. So he's gonna have a defense of zero at this, meaning he's going to take a full six damage. Oh boy, the Prince has already taken 10 damage in two turns. At this point, the prince might be thinking he's getting in a little over his head. Get it? Over his head? Because, you know, the woodsmen are standing over his head, and so they're getting the bonus. So let's see what the prince does on his knight turn. He is just going to move forward. He can move forward one, two, three spaces. He won't be able to move four forward, because if we measure out this height difference here, he actually has to go up two pegs to get up to that next space in front of him. So that would take him two move instead of one. So he's only going to be able to move here. Now that might seem like the prince is in a very lousy position, but let's take a look at this from a different angle. If we zoom in here on the head of our militia man, and we look around, the prince is nowhere to be seen. This means the prince Jalen cannot be shot by the woodsman. This is going to force our rebel player's hands. What he's going to do is he's going to move his militia man down this ladder and have him stop actually off of the oracle so that our woodsman can climb down onto the ladder and get one last good shot on Prince Jalen with that beautiful height advantage. And our rebel player rolls a four. That's not a critical hit, so for once, Jalen gets to roll his full defense of eight. Oh, and he only rolls a two, which again, because that height advantage and that tactical positioning is going to become a zero. So Jalen takes another four damage. So that's a pretty big yikes. Let's see how Prince Jalen responds. So he's gonna start by moving closer. He would very much love to just move up here and attack that woodsman. But unfortunately, if he goes there, the woodsman is still standing above his head. And since Jalen is a melee combatant, his head needs to be above the bottom of his enemy figure if he's gonna be attacking him. Unless he's attacking through a transit pad that links to that ladder, but that is on the inside of the Oracle, so he is not there yet. So instead, he's gonna run up this hill, actually. He's gonna go one, two, three, and move himself into position to attack this militia man. This way he won't have to worry about moving up more difficult elevation than he needs to after this militia man is dealt with. Now, of course, that's assuming that Jalen can kill this militia man. Now, if we look back at our friend, the militia man, he does have a slashing shield, a slashing shield that blocks nine damage. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're like, core bricks, what is this? You're just rigging the game against the kingdom player. First, you rigged this fight against the rebels in the first video, and now you're gonna send Prince Jalen into his death because he's attacking units that have armor against him. And ho ho, as much as I would love to send Prince Jalen off to his death, what if I told you he had an ace up his sleeve? What if I told you that in his free inventory slot, he was carrying another weapon, a second weapon just for this occasion? And so let's plop Prince Jalen back at his starting spot, because if you watched my video on taking a turn in the Circle of Realms, you may recall that the first phase of a turn is a inventory rearrangement phase. You can do this before you move and attack. And so Prince Jalen is going to take advantage of that. He's going to use that phase to unequip his mithril sword and instead equip this steel battle axe that he's been carrying in his inventory for just this kind of an occasion. And so now that the prince has the steel battle axe in his hand, he can charge forward against this militia man, knowing full well that the militia man has no armor against this hacking attack. 
Steel Battle Axe is a respectable weapon that can be found on the field in the Circle of Realms. There are three of them in my game, at least as of today. They have a hacking attack type and they deal eight damage. So he's not even really downgrading his weapon at all to switch from his Mithril Sword to the Axe. The number's exactly the same. He is just switching to an attack type that cuts right through this militia man's armor. Plus, let's remember, Prince Jalen doesn't mess around. He's not a common unit. He's got some more tricks up his sleeve as well. And so he's not gonna attack him with a regular attack. Instead, he's going to attack him with a Hawk Strike. And if we look at his unit page, Prince Jalen's Hawk Strike is a lot like a Hawk Knight's Hawk Strike, but it packs a bit more of a punch and allows him to form three attacks instead of the Hawk Knight's two attacks. Now, Hawk Strike requires Prince Jalen to max out his weapon attack damage at eight, but that's not a problem because his Steel Battle Axe already does a damage of eight in the first place. His precision rating is gonna get a little bit worse. It will be five instead of four, but that's a very small penalty for being able to attack three times in one unit command. So we're gonna have three attacks of Hacking Eight coming right in on this Militia Man. So let's see how this unfolds. So let's see what he can do with his base attack of four and his weapon attack of Hacking Eight. So for his first attack, Prince Jalen rolls a 10. Turns out that slightly higher precision rating of five isn't such a bad thing after all, because it allowed him to score a critical hit here. 10 hacking damage coming in, and we're gonna be cutting our defense in half. So our militia man is only gonna be able to roll a defense of four. And he rolls a two. Now, because Jalen did have to run up elevation, momentum is working against him, so this defense of two will become a defense of three. But 10 minus three is still seven wounds on this militia. That's a lot of damage in just one attack. And Jalen can do this two more times if he needs to. So let's see how his second attack goes. And this time Prince Jalen only rolls a three. That's not gonna be a critical hit. And so our militia man gets to roll a full eight against it. And our militia man rolls a five, which thanks to Jalen's lost momentum will become a defensive six meaning that Jalen is gonna take three wounds. Not the outcome the Kingdom player wanted, but let's see how this last roll goes. This time Jalen rolls a seven. That's not gonna be a critical hit, but it might just be enough to take out this Militia Man. And our Militia Man rolls a two. Now, even when this defense becomes three, our Militia Man is still gonna take four damage from this. And so our Rebel Militia Man after the big noble fight he did to try to claim this oracle is no more. Now that concludes our Kingdom Player's day turn, so let's turn our attention over to our rebels. There's only two of them left, and only one of them can even hurt Prince Jalen. It's not a good time to be a part of the Bloodless Rebellion. Now our woodsman wants to get that height advantage back on Prince Jalen, so he is going to move back up the oracle. One, two spaces over so that he can shoot the prince from relative safety. It is nighttime, so we're only gonna be rolling a two and a four. So let's see how our woodsman does. And he rolls a five. So five damage coming into Prince Jalen. And once again, we've got this height advantage and tactical positioning. So Prince Jalen's gonna reduce his roll by two. Let's see how he does. And the prince rolls a two, which becomes a zero, meaning the prince is gonna take five more damage from this attack. This woodsman with the blunderbuss has been causing the prince a lot of pain. Our kingdom player is doing his knight turn and he's learned a little bit over the course of this fight. He double checks the armor of the woodsman and realizes that the woodsman does have hacking armor. So what Jalen is going to do is he's going to re-equip his mithril sword and now he's going to go after the woodsman. So he moves one, two, three, four spaces right up to this woodsman. Now, because it's night, our kingdom player doesn't want to increase his precision rating any more than it needs to go up. He's just going to attack the woodsman with a single normal attack. And because it's night, his weapon attack of eight is gonna have four subtracted from it, becoming just a weapon attack of four. So he's gonna be able to roll the D4 two times, basically. So let's see what he gets for his attack. His first roll is a three, looking pretty good. And his second roll is also a three, meaning he's gonna be dealing six damage here. Now our woodsman does have a defense of six, and because Jalen had to climb up this ladder to attack him, momentum is working against Jalen. So we're going to add one to the roll of our woodsman. So let's see what our woodsman gets. 
He rolls a four, it becomes a five, so the woodsman only takes one damage. And so now we move over to day again. And on our day turn here, our rebel player is getting a little bit nervous. He's going to move his woodsman back so that he can shoot the prince from what it, he at least feels is a safer position. Uh-oh, for once it seems like our rebel player is the one making the mistake here because this woodsman has just left Prince Jalen's zone of control. And that's gonna trigger an attack of opportunity. Now, I haven't talked about these yet. And to explain them, I think we're going to move our figures a little bit just to illustrate what's going on here. So say we have Prince Jalen standing here. Prince Jalen has a zone of control. A zone of control is any space that is neighboring a unit. So in this situation, Prince Jalen's zone of control would be these eight spaces that are surrounding him. Anytime a unit leaves another unit's zone of control, then they are going to provoke an attack of opportunity. It doesn't matter what the attack range is of the unit. If a unit is standing in any of these spaces, like here, here, or here, then if they leave Prince Jalen's zone of control, then they are going to provoke an attack of opportunity. This can happen even if a unit enters the zone of control and leaves it during the same turn. As long as someone's leaving that zone, then they're going to invite an attack from Jalen. Now, an attack of opportunity is different from a normal attack in two big ways. So way number one has to do with our defender. Now, our defender is just running away. They aren't fighting back. They aren't parrying. They aren't reposting. And so for that reason, our defender can't roll a defense die when they're getting hit by an attack of opportunity. Now, on the other hand, our attacker isn't really giving this the same level of attention that they are giving a normal attack. They are, after all, doing this attack when it is not one of their unit commands. And some of them are even kind of stretching a little bit out of their normal range to make this attack of opportunity. And so for this reason, the attacker doesn't get to roll both of their attack dice. They get to choose. They can attack either with their weapon attack or they can attack with their base attack. If they hit with their weapon attack, they still hit for their normal weapon attack damage. If they roll for their base attack, they can choose to either hit with their weapon attack damage type or they can choose to hit with blunt damage instead. This would be the equivalent of basically tripping or punching or kicking the opponent as their opponent runs by. An attack opportunity can still be blocked by armor, but being able to pick between these two different attack types does open up some opportunities for the attacker. Aside from that, we do not apply any other modifiers to an attack of opportunity. There are no penalties or bonuses applied to defense because there is no defense die being rolled. We also don't penalize the attack if it's happening at night. The fact that we're only rolling one die is enough. So if we go back to Prince Jalen in this situation, he can either attack with his base attack of four or his weapon attack of eight. And since this woodsman doesn't have slashing armor, we're gonna attack with that weapon attack. Now the result of that roll is a six, meaning that the woodsman is going to take six more damage. Since he doesn't get to roll defense, there's just six damage straight to him. He's got no armor to block it, making this probably a pretty poor move on our woodsman's part. So my friends, as always, if you like this video, hit that like button. If you're new to the channel and you're not subscribed yet, please subscribe if you think you're at all interested in this interplay between Legos and Wargaming in one place. And as always, don't forget, if you want to actually read through these rules at your own pace, you can go over to my website, www.circleofrealms.com. And if you go there, you can find all these rules explained in the guide, as well as links to the videos on those actual rule pages. You can, you know, you can play the video in the background while you're scrolling through and reading as you go. I'm also always thrilled to hear your thoughts down in the comments below. Let me know if you like aspects of my rules. Let me know if there's things that you don't like or things you'd change, if you've got suggestions for me. I've been working on and playing this game for many years now, and the rules have been constantly evolving in that time period. So if you've got good ideas, I might go ahead and implement them down the road. Now our woodsman's gonna shoot back, of course, at the prince. It is daytime, so he's going to be hitting with his full attack. He rolls only an attack of four. That's not a critical hit. It's only gonna be four damage coming in to the prince. Jalen defends with a seven. This is more than enough defense to prevent Jalen from getting hurt. And now it's his turn. And he's quite happy because the two woodsmen have separated themselves from each other. Meaning if he successfully kills this blunderbuss guy, the other woodsman is not gonna be able to pick up that gun. And so Jalen moves his full move. Despite our woodsman's best effort, Prince Jalen was able to just run into attack range anyway. And you know what he's going to do. He is going to hit him with a hawk strike. So let's get ready for three attacks of raw pain here. Our first attack is only a three. That's not gonna be a critical hit with hawk strike. So let's see how our woodsman respond. So it looks like our woodsman is only taking two damage, but it's about to get worse. When you're about to take damage from hacking, slashing, or shredding attack types, rolls of one are a special thing in the circle of realms. 
They mean that your unit has maneuvered themselves in such a poor position that we are about to take advantage of the coolest feature of using a Lego minifigure as a miniature in a war game. Side rant, I love the Lego minifigure so much. I remember when I was younger, I thought it was very interesting when Lego came out with those Heroica games. I was like, oh, that's cool. They're kind of doing like the little board game thing like I've been doing. But then I was looking at it and I was like, they don't have minifigures in this. They had the micro figures instead. And that's really disappointing to me because the minifigure is so cool. You can fully customize the minifigure. You can bend the minifigure into all sorts of crazy poses. And last, but certainly not least, you can remove limbs from the minifigure. You can pop out the hands and you can pop off the legs very easily. And for the most part, without damaging the minifigure. And so in my game, I wanna take advantage of that. And the main way I do this is through dismemberment. Dismemberment occurs when three conditions have been satisfied. Condition number one is that somebody needs to roll ones. Either the attacker needs to roll ones for their attack, which means they have to roll two ones because they roll two dice, or the defender has to roll a one in their defense. This means it's a lot harder for an attacker to get dismembered than it is for a defender. The odds of rolling two ones are not nearly as high as the odds of rolling a single one. Condition number two, the unit that rolled the one or the ones needs to actually get damaged from the attack. If they don't take any damage, then they can't be dismembered. You could be hurt if a limb's gonna pop off, you know? And condition number three is that the weapon that is damaging you has to be of one of the three attack types that involve cutting. That's either slashing, hacking, or shredding attack types. This makes slashing more valuable than it might look on paper, because even though slashing is the most common armor in the Circle of Realms, because it can cause dismemberment, that means it is quite useful. Hacking, of course, is a little bit more valuable, and then shredding is by far the best attack type when it comes to getting around armor and causing an effect like dismemberment. It's worth noting that universal attacks can't cause dismemberment on their own unless they have an ability that allows them to do so. So that Blunderbuss isn't gonna be taking off any limbs, only Jalen's sword is. So if we look at our situation, We've got a slashing attack type coming in, we've got a one rolled, and this militia man's definitely taking damage, so he's gonna be dismembered. And to do that, we're gonna roll my favorite die, the dismemberment die. Now the dismemberment die is pretty nifty. So this guy is actually made using those, uh, those dice pieces that were from Lego's era of the Heroica sets, and their like foray into little Lego board games and stuff like that. I don't know if they still release anything like that today. Um, I can't remember the last time they put out anything along those lines, but it's a cool little piece. It's got two by two like little surfaces on each side that you can fill with plates or whatever. And so I use that to create our dismemberment die. It's a six sided die. It has two sides that are RA and LA, that would be right arm and left arm. And it's also got LL and RL, which is left leg and right leg. And then it has these two other sides. It has a DC and an AC side. And those stand for defender's choice and attacker's choice. And basically the side that you roll determines what part of the figure is removed. If the arm is removed, we just pop the hand off, not the whole arms because I know I said you can generally pop things on and off a minifigure without damaging it, but man, if you pop those arms off too many times, it'll make a nice crack running down the side of the torso. And right leg and left leg take off those legs. AC and DC are exactly what they sound like. The attacker gets to decide what limb is lost or the defender gets to decide what limb is lost. They can't decide to not have a limb lost. They just get to pick which one is gonna be removed. And losing a limb is pretty significant. Unlike a normal injury, you cannot get the loss of a limb healed by any normal means. Anything that heals damage for a minifigure does not necessarily restore limb loss. Typically, the only way to get a limb back on a figure is to let that figure die and either be retrained or resurrected onto the battlefield. And I like this mechanic for a few reasons. One, I do think it's an awesome mechanic. I like popping limbs off of units, and there's just something really satisfying in being like, whoa, when someone gets their hand cut off, it's a... It's a big moment if it's an important figure. But also mechanically, what I like about this is it prevents people from relying solely on their heroes. You're gonna be a little bit more hesitant to have your hero go in and fight everyone by themselves, even though our kingdom player is doing it right now. Because the more and more attacks your unit does, the more likely it is you're gonna roll those double ones and suffer dismemberment. So what does it mean if you lose one of these things? Well, if you lose a hand, then you drop whatever that hand is holding. If it's one of the unit's original inventory items, then they just go right back into their inventory. We don't drop those items onto the field. But if they're holding something that they picked up from the board, it pops right back onto the battlefield. And the unit no longer gets any benefits from anything that was held in that hand. So if they lose their main hand, then they cannot hold a main hand weapon anymore. And a lot of the units start with a main hand weapon by default. In that situation, that unit is reduced to just their base attack when they're attacking because they do not have a weapon. 
Alternatively, they could end up losing a hand that holds a shield, which would limit their armor. Or if they're lucky, they could lose a hand that's not doing anything at all. Losing a leg, on the other hand, slows a unit down. So if a unit loses a leg, then their movement is reduced by two. That can be pretty crippling. It can take a unit and make it almost useless, depending on how fast they were to begin with. If a unit loses both legs to dismemberment, they do not fall on the ground and just lay there. Uh, they actually are killed from that. It's not really fun to have a unit that's just flopping around on the ground. Plus, you know, how much blood loss can a unit really withstand until they go? Um, a unit can't lose the same limb twice. If a unit has already lost their right hand, for example, and then they experience dismemberment a second time, if you roll right arm again, then nothing actually happens. The unit is spared from being dismembered a second time if you re-roll on the same body part. So now that we know all this, let's go ahead and roll our dismemberment die for our woodsman and let's see what he's gonna be losing. Now our woodsman has rolled the AC side of the die or attacker's choice. This means that Prince Jalen is gonna decide which limb he cuts off of the woodsman. And can you guess which one he's gonna get rid of? That's right, he is cutting off this hand that was holding onto the blunderbuss. And so now our woodsman has no right hand and the blunderbuss drops to the ground. That's pretty devastating, but we've still got up to two more attacks to go from this hawk strike. So let's roll the prince's next attack. And wouldn't you know it, he rolls an attack of 12. That's the maximum of damage that Prince Jalen can deal in an attack. It's not a critical hit, but it is double the woodsman's defense. So no matter what our woodsman tries to do, he is going to die here. We're gonna remove all of his hit points and pop the woodsman out of the battlefield. Right after he lost his right hand, he has now lost his life as well. Now a rebel player doesn't have a whole lot of options at this point. He has one woodsman left. That woodsman can't hurt Prince Jalen and it can't get to the blunderbuss because Prince Jalen is standing in the way of it. If this woodsman were to try to run away, Prince Jalen would almost certainly just catch him. And so what the rebel player is going to do, just to make it a little bit harder for Prince Jalen to kill this woodsman, is the rebel player is going to fortify with the woodsman. Now, fortifying is the last of the rules I have to explain today. And it is, quite frankly, the last aspect of combat to go over. All the other tricks that we can see units do in combat are gonna be tied to their special attacks or their special abilities or spells or their unit type. And that's gonna differ from unit to unit. Now, if you've ever played a turn-taking video game, a lot of video games have the ability to have your unit just defend for a turn. And that is essentially what fortifying is. When you fortify during a unit command, you skip the movement phase and you skip the final phase of your unit's turn. Essentially, they get to rearrange their inventory at the beginning and then that's it. But they get two things out of doing this. First, they immediately heal for one hit point of damage. So this is a way that if your unit is really desperately in need of a heal, you can give them a hit point back from fortifying. But it's not a whole lot and it's really not normally gonna be worth using a unit command to get that hit point back. Additionally, until this unit's next Next turn, it does receive a plus one bonus to all of its defense rolls. Kind of like having a momentum bonus or a height advantage, but you get it in any situation and it will stack with those other bonuses. But again, you're giving up an entire unit command to do this. So it's not typically a good option if you've got a bunch of units that you can command on the battlefield. And so that woodsman does it, giving him that plus one pre-rolled bonus. The idea here is that if the rebel player fortifies, that extra defensive bonus might be enough to scare off the prince from doing an attack at night and the rebel player's right. Prince Jalen doesn't want to risk it. The kingdom player decides to just keep the prince standing exactly where he is. Doesn't even take a unit command with the prince. I mean, why would he? It's not like this rebel player can hurt him. The most damage the rebel player can deal can't even get through his armor. And so then we'll have to fast forward to the day. This is the turn when the rebel player decides it's not worth it to do anything with the woodsman. Even if he does fortify with him, it probably won't be enough to protect him against the triple attack hawk strike that Prince Jalen's gonna deal out. And so the rebel player chooses not to do anything over at this part of the board, and instead focuses their attention at other ears of the game board where their turns can be more productive. But when it comes to the kingdom player's turn, he's not gonna skip this time. He's gonna move Prince Jalen right into attack position against this woodsman, and he is going to strike him with a hawk strike. And let's see here, I think I can position my roller. Let's see if I use the dismemberment die to help prop it up. Oh, perfect. And so Jalen gets to roll three attacks with a maximum damage of 12. There are no modifiers in this attack, no bonuses, no penalties. We are just going to roll and see what happens. So for Jalen's first attack, he rolls a six, dealing a maximum of six damage. Defender 
rolls a six as well. So the woodsman ekes by with no wounds. Hawk strike number two. So let's see how he rolls. Jalen rolls a 10. That is a critical hit. That means our woodsman only rolls a defense of three. Let's see what he gets. And he rolls a three, meaning that woodsman is taking seven damage. We've got one last hawk strike. Let's see what that roll ends up being. And Jalen rolls a nine. It's not a critical hit, but it still ends up dealing four damage to the woodsman, which is more than enough to finish him off. And our woodsman is killed. That was quite a few turns just for us to end where we began with the kingdom player in control of the Oracle. But of course, many lives were lost along the way. A moment of silence for our arbalists, woodsmen, militiamen, and hawk knight. So anyway, I hope you enjoyed that little mock battle and uh, learning about how I do combat in my LEGO war game. At this point, I think I've gone through enough of the rules for you to have a general appreciation or understanding of any unit I show you. I mean, sure, we haven't talked about exactly how buildings work and stuff like that, but it's pretty intuitive. So I think that for my next several videos, instead of doing these long rule videos, we're gonna do some shorter looks at individual units and buildings in the Circle of Realms. We'll spend some more time looking at that Cusp Kingdom and seeing what else it has to offer outside of Prince Jalen and his friends in blue armor. I'm sure I'll get back to doing more rules eventually. It's just, you know, rules are cool, but I really enjoy talking about units and factions more. I know that when I'm making an update to the game, I'm talking to my friends, the thing that I really wanna share with them all the time, are like, hey, look at this cool unit I designed, or look at this new ability that's getting added to this unit, or look at how I changed this building. It's very rarely things like, yo, look at how I changed the way height advantage works. But regardless, you know, we'll cover it all. Please let me know down in the comments what you would like to see me covering in future videos. If you're more interested in learning more about the rule set, or if there are particular types of units you're more interested in seeing, or you wanna learn more about the game board itself, or if you wanna learn more about my reasoning behind why I decided to do things certain ways. I'm obviously a very young YouTube channel, so you know, I'm still trying to figure out what it is exactly people would enjoy seeing or hearing about the most. Other than that, my friends, as always, be happy, be healthy, be well, and I will see you next time here in the Circle of Realms.